Hello, okay. everyone. Welcome to the Revolution 250 podcast. I am Bob Allison, the chair of the Rev 250 Advisory Group. And Revolution 250 is a consortium of about 70 groups in and around Massachusetts looking at ways to commemorate the American Revolution. And our guest today is Roger Williams, who comes to us from New Jersey. Roger, thanks for joining us. Well, it's great to be with you, Bob, and and I'm a I'm a fan of the program, so Wonderful. it's great to be here. Great, great to have you with us. And um, Roger is the state historian of the New Jersey Society of the Sons of the American Revolution, and also the vice chair of the History Committee of the National Society of the Sons of the American Revolution. And the real thing we want to talk to you about today is your wonderful website and various programs that go under the heading of 10 Crucial Days, 10crucialdays.org. So what are the 10 Crucial Days? Well, I'm sure everybody is familiar with that iconic painting, um, Emanuel Leutze painting of Washington crossing the Delaware, the second most iconic image in American military history. Uh, when I moved back into the area um, after working in Manhattan for many years in publishing, I wanted to just do something for fun um, that uh, for my passion for history. And I became one of the lead historians over at Washington Crossing Historic Park in Pennsylvania. Uh, told that story, of course, with the um, we have a at the visitor center. We've got a digital image, full size digital image of the Washington wow. Crossing, the Delaware. And um, that grew. Uh, I um, also became a historian, um, uh, interpreter, historic interpreter over at Princeton Battlefield. And we tied the two together. Uh, a group of us uh, launched, uh, if, you, <laughs> if you'll excuse mm -hmm. the expression, 10crucialdays.org, mm -hmm. which is really a, um, it's a 501c3 nonprofit that promotes the sites and venues of the 10 Crucial Days campaigns of Trenton and Princeton. So we give tours of mm -hmm. Washington Crossing, Trenton, Princeton. Uh, I must do these. I, I do these tours two, three times a month. Um, wow. Bus tours during the 10 Crucial Days period, which is 10 Crucial Days is January. I'm sorry, December 25th, 1776 to January 3rd, 1777 where essentially the, the times that tried men's souls, all, see, all hope seemed lost. Right. <clears throat> Washington, uh, through some really brilliant maneuvers, managed to turn the whole thing, well, brilliant and lucky maneuvers, right. yeah. turned the whole thing around um, hmm. and um, uh, solidified his position as the commander in chief. Right. It really is, it's, because we know how it came out. It's sometimes hard, easy to overlook how difficult it was and how much chance was involved and how much more likely it was to have gone wrong than to have succeeded. So um, this wasn't, though, you, you moved to this area and then got into this story. So what really surprised you being on the scene in places like Washington's Crossing, Princeton, Trenton, and seeing these sites? Well, it's interesting. I actually grew up in Vermont. Mm -hmm. I'm, a, I'm a Vermont boy. Okay. Um, my my ancestor was a Green Mountain boy. And mm -hmm. My father taught school down here. So we, we moved down here, spent a lot of time down here in Princeton, New Jersey. So I spent a lot of time at Princeton Battlefield when I yeah. was growing up. Mm -hmm. um, and um, so I I had always had a sense of the revolution both at home in vermont and here in princeton um but it wasn't until i started reading back really in high school when i started reading um thomas tom fleming and, mm -hmm. and um, many of the historians that we know and love write about the revolution and then of course um what was really fascinating to me uh, when I started learning the, learning the ground, learning the territory, learning about the farms. So it wasn't so much just learning about the battles and the troop movements. It was learning about the, the farms that were here and, mm -hmm. and just how different the landscape is now than when it was in uh, mm -hmm. the colonial era. So when we give our tours, we try and give a sense of just how different it, 
it, right. it looked then. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I don't know, maybe we can talk a bit about the battles themselves, um, starting with the crossing and the first battle of Trenton. So can you tell us what's at stake there and what is Washington's plan? What's he hoping to do? Sure. Um, well, the my first favorite question when I give our tours, when, when I talk to folks who who come to any of the parks down here is, what was Washington doing in Bucks County, Pennsylvania? Why was he on the western uh, uh, bank of the Delaware River? How did he get down there? Well, after the siege of Boston, um, the troops moved down, Washington and the troops moved down uh, to the New York area. And of course, trying to defend New York was um, a Sisyphean task. I mean, the idea of trying to defend three different islands, Long Island, Manhattan Island, Staten Island, with no Navy and an inexperienced army, well, the inevitable happened. Uh, the, the British just overwhelmed Washington's um, uh, nascent army. And Washington had to find a place to um, lick his wounds, essentially, right. after losing more than 60% of his army. And he reasoned that if he would march south uh, from what was at the time a more loyalist East Jersey, which mm -hmm. today we call New York Giants fans in North Jersey, or down to West Jersey, which is Philadelphia Eagles fans right. you know, on, on the uh, western bank of the Delaware River, he would be able to collect up more militia. Well, he, that didn't really happen because right. he couldn't win. You know, they, they were losing all these battles and his army was about to just completely dissipate with their enlistments ending at the end of the year. He had to do something. Right. And when the Howe brothers who really backed off at the end of the year. They didn't want to be known as uh, slaughtering their fellow Englishmen and decided that this whole thing was going to be over by the end of the year when the army dissipated completely. Um, Washington, and they set up, the Howe brothers set up these cantonments, these posts mm -hmm. throughout the Jerseys, occupied the state mm -hmm. in um, rather, rather brutal fashion. Um, and... At that point, Washington looked across the river, recognizing that if he didn't do something before the end of the year, all hope would be lost here right. six months after the declaration, it would be gone. But recognizing that even though his army was smaller at this point, perhaps only 3,000 men with him, if he started picking off those cantonments one by one, mm -hmm. he might be able to turn this thing around. And that is where that famous Christmas night crossing uh, came into play where he, he um, targeted the most exposed of the outpost under uh, the Hessian outpost under Johann Gottlieb Brawl in Trenton. And mm -hmm. it was really just a raid. I mean, the battle only took maybe 45 minutes, but in that 45 minutes captured over 900 Hessian soldiers. And this was really his, First victory. Harlem Heights was sort of a draw, but this was really Washington's first major uh, combat victory, if you will. Right. So that was that was the first Battle of Trent. Oh, okay. We're talking with Roger Williams, who is the proprietor of Ten Crucial Days, December twenty fifth, seventeen seventy six to January third, seventeen seventy seven, looking at those days when Washington and his army really turned the revolution around and save it, in fact, in the depth of the winter in New Jersey. And so, so he does, by the way, what happens to all those Hessians when they're captured? Well, um, it, it's uh, the immediately after, there's this myth that the reason why he attacked on the 25th is that these all these Hessian soldiers were partying it up and mm -hmm. and they were drunk, you know, from from their Christmas revelry. Not true at all. Um, these soldiers were uh, they were crack soldiers, but they had been under constant attack throughout mm -hmm. the entire month of December from militia and small units crossing the river and attacking their foraging parties. They were ready. They were ready for a fight. The problem mm -hmm. was is that it was just pure insanity. Um, 
to uh, attack in the miserable nor'easter that right. was, occurred on the night of tw December 25th. So that's why they were caught by surprise. Um, immediately after this victory, uh, many of the Continental soldiers, most of them New Englanders, mm -hmm. were absolutely elated with this victory and started breaking into some of the taverns and oh. on, on Front Street. And those that's where you get your drunk soldiers. Right. <laughs> it, was, no. it was our boys. Yeah. Um, after, so immediately after this, the battle, Washington wanted to get, uh, not knowing the disposition of another garrison that was just further, about 12 miles further south, or uh, what was going on with another garrison about uh, eight miles further north, Washington wanted to get his troops back across into Bucks County, back on the western bank of the Delaware, along with his 900 prisoners. Oh. Those prisoners were subsequently marched through the streets of Philadelphia to great fanfare and then put on parole, this 18th century manner of putting your putting mm -hmm. the soldiers out uh, in the farmland. And so they, they sent many of these uh, Hessian boys out to the German speaking farms in, in uh, Pennsylvania and on, on parole until they were exchanged later on. As it turns out, 53% of the Hessian garrison uh, ended up staying here in America. I have a very good friend whose ancestors, and one of his ancestors was one of these soldiers who had been paroled after Trenton and was marched south and to, he went to Maryland. And then, uh, so yeah. So it's an interesting story that you would simply say, okay, you know, you're done fighting and off you go. Yeah. Well, Washington does get his men back across the river. And then what happens? Well, I mean, the idea that he had this one victory um, had they just rested on their laurels, uh, mm -hmm. really not much would have happened. And it really would have that one little raid would have gone down as a footnote in history. Washington really needed to be able to accomplish something uh, more significant. He needed to um, clear the, uh, the occupation of the British army in the Jerseys. Mm -hmm. So um, getting word that some of the troops that could not cross that, that fateful night mm -hmm. um, had indeed crossed along with the first contingent of uh, Continental Marines. Uh, this was the first land engagement for the Marine Corps. Mm. Uh, or today what we call the Marine Corps, um, uh, along with um, some regiments, uh, fresh regiments from the Philadelphia Associators. I always like to explain, what's an associator? Well, in, Phil in Pennsylvania, you, it was a Quaker state. You couldn't have militias. Right. But you had associations. So the, these Philadelphia Associators, these militia units, uh, crossed the river and sent word that they were on the in back in Jersey, and at this point now the Howe brothers were no more Mister Nice Guy. They yeah. were not going to back off. They became much more aggressive. They pulled General Charles Cornwallis uh, off of his ship, uh, who he was ready to go home to visit his ailing wife Jemima, mm -hmm. uh, and collect up some of the regiments that were. Uh, in the cantonments throughout New Jersey and really end this affair. Um, and they marched south uh, by January 2nd, uh, 1777, Washington having convinced about half of the experienced Continentals who had taken part in the first battle uh, to stick with him. But he had been now reinforced by those re Philadelphia associators. Mm -hmm. so he was now up to about 5,000 troops oh. facing eight to 9,000 British, angry British and Hessian troops. And on the banks uh, of the Assumpink Creek, this is often referred to as the Second Battle of Trenton. It's rather diminished as the Second Battle of Trenton. It was really an incredibly significant battle mm -hmm. that happened on January 2nd. There was a, a brilliant delaying action by Colonel Edward Hand of the Pennsylvania Rifles mm -hmm. that kept Cornwallis from getting into Trenton until dark. A cannonade uh, occurred on the night of January 2nd. Mm -hmm. uh, Cornwallis broke off that attack, expecting that the next day he was going to outflank Washington and end the whole affair. Mm -hmm. Washington had something else in mind. Ah. With some local intelligence, 
he was able to find a back road that headed toward the the British Fourth Brigade, who were in Trent uh, in Princeton, mm -hmm. and uh, unbeknownst to uh, uh, to Cornwallis, he managed to sneak the entire army in a brilliant uh, mm. flanking maneuver uh, and march east and then north and attack the the eleven hundred uh, men of the British Fourth Brigade in 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 Princeton the next morning, January third, and that was the culmination of the ten crucial days. Well, we're, we're talking with Roger Williams, who is a historian in New Jersey, focusing on these 10 crucial days that saved the revolution. And it is really part of the national myth. You know, you mentioned Emanuel Lutz's painting, which is a fascinating work. I wonder if we could just spend a couple of minutes talking about the painting itself. The first thing, I, I, I mean, you know much more about the painting than I do, but we've heard the stories that it's not accurate and Washington wouldn't have been standing up and other issues, but the painting itself is telling a story. David Hackett, our friend David Hackett Fisher did a marvelous uh, job in, in the beginning of his book, Washington Crossing, talking about this remarkable, uh, uh, remarkable iconic painting. And when we give the tours, we, we say, you know, you all recognize this painting. What you don't know is that it's all wrong. It, it's typical of many of the paintings of the, right. uh, the revolution in the 18th century. Um, and I, I love Paul Stady's uh, book of arms and artists, where he talks about the propaganda nature of the art of the revolution. And um, what with, Alo with Leutz's painting, um, it, it, it's inspiring, it's remarkable, um, but it has so many errors in it. You can spend a whole class just on yep. the painting itself. The, the, it, we call it 13 men in a rowboat. I mean, it's, it, whereas the, the actual boats were 65 feet long, they fit, uh, 30 to 40 soldiers. They were, uh, common, they were, um, mastered by Glover's Marblehead Regiment. Roger, um, what? Boats yeah. built, or they weren't built to carry soldiers. They, these boats were built um, up at the Durham Iron Works um, it, near what is uh, today Eastern Pennsylvania to carry timber and iron ore uh, and hay and goods up and down the river, which is part of the story. They weren't right. built to go across the river. And Glover's Marbleheaders managed to get them across the river by pointing them straight up the river and then letting them drift to be, to become across the river. Sure. The painting, of course, shows, you know, daylight in the background. It was the middle of a nor'easter. I mean, yep. you couldn't see 10 feet in front of you. Um, they weren't sitting down. They were all standing up in the boat. And Washington himself, we figure, was not in the boat itself. He probably would have been, uh, most likely would have been on one of the flat bottom ferry boats that mm -hmm. carried the horse and right. the 18 cannon that Henry Knox managed uh, convinced Washington to bring with him. So you sort of see them in the background of the Loitza painting. Mm -hmm. But Emanuel Loitza had painted that um, work in 1848, 1851. There were actually two versions of the same painting uh, trying to convince his fellow countrymen to join mm -hmm. together with Prussia to become one Germany. Ironic, of course, that right. uh, a German is painting a, uh, the Americans, the 13 Americans, each which represent uh, a different uh, a different state at the time. So it's it's a it's a lot of fun to and and yeah. of course the flag is the they, it shows the Betsy Ross flag, which didn't <laughs> exist at that time. <laughs> Of course, here in Boston at the MFA, we have Thomas Sully's painting of the Delaware crossing, which is actually the scene on the land as Henry Knox is overseeing the cannon. And also we have these, and that was done, I think, for the, the North Carolina State House, but it was, the painting was too big for the space. So there's a lesson there of measure twice and cut once. And, <laughs> so, but it's a tremendous story. So you have these two massive canvases and the Lloyds is, the one mu much better known, and we've seen many renditions of it over the years just because it is such an, I hate to use the word iconic, but this is an American icon, this scene. One of the 
one of the things I'm trying to curate for my website is the image, the parodies and images of the, right. of the art of the 10 crucial days, yeah. because of course there are so many versions of Washington crossing the Delaware yeah. uh, that's used um, all the time. Uh, we like the Kunstler uh, version of Washington on the flat bottom ferry boat um, with his hand on the cannon. Mm -hmm. um, and of course it's, um, but it, it, as I said, as and as I tell all the school children, when they come to Washington Crossing Historic Park, I point out to them that they're going to see this image for the rest of their lives. Right. Now I'm going to tell them what really happened. Right, right, right. So it's a great story in the painting. And I, I mean, you are so privileged to be able to spend your time telling these stories about the 10 crucial days and then all of the important things that are related to it. You know, you have Thomas Paine and the um, other parts of the story, what happens with the Hessians afterward. And you also, you do bus tours too. So how, um, what do people see when they go on one of the 10 Crucial Days bus tours? So at 10crucialdays.org, um, you can see our uh, see see where our bus tours, they start, they all start at Washington Crossing Historic Park. Um, my partner, Larry Kidder, who's the author of another book called just called 10 Crucial Days, which I, I have to say is actually the most recent scholarship right. on what we know about the area. Um, Larry also wrote a terrific book on militia activity in the area. Um, we we tell the story together. We tag team and tell the story together as we visit each of the sites. Um, we explain uh, the logistics of the crossing, uh, mm -hmm. the, the weather conditions, the farmer, the farmland and who were the farmers, who were the who were the militiamen mm -hmm. who brought Washington's troops into uh, into Trenton. You know, these these boys who fought this battle. Uh, were mostly from New England, Virginia, and Pennsylvania. They were not New Jersey uh, so soldiers, but the 24 uh, guides who brought them in were all New Jersey militiamen. Mm -hmm. um, and then when we get into Trenton, of course, it's an urban area at this point, much like when you're in Boston, you know, you, you do the tour in Boston, and you sort of see all the buildings around you. That's what we have to do in Trenton, Right. Um, is kind of explain what the houses were like, what the farms were like in and around Trenton. And then the same thing with Princeton. Uh, Princeton Battlefield State Park is absolutely magnificent. And this, you know, it's hallowed ground. But, um, you know, you're, you're also in the middle of a, a, a community right. um, surrounded by a community. And we talk about the Quaker land. This is one of the ironies of the American, the, these major battles up in the Northern Theater Brandywine, Princeton. This was all, all these battles were fought on Quaker land. Mm -hmm. Who were these people that settled yeah. up here? So. Interesting. It's, in, that, that, it's interesting. And part of the um, Princeton battle takes place actually in the one building that was Princeton at the time, Nassau Hall. And the, the last basically half hour of the entire section uh, se of the entire battle. I mean, the, the battle really, uh, the, the engagement that took place on the battlefield, which was just about a mile south of Nassau Hall, um, was where most of the this brutal uh, engagement took place, where uh, a lot of soldiers were in close quarter and fought um, a very brutal and bloody battle. Uh, but after the British were, com were overwhelmed by the vast number of the Americans that were on the field that morning. It was really a cleanup action where Washington and the New England regiments at the vanguard uh, mm -hmm. surrounded the remaining um, soldiers of the 40th Regiment of Infantry in what, what, is, what was then the largest building in colonial America, what mm -hmm. is today Nassau Hall. It was then called the College of New Jersey. And it is now Princeton University. So they were surrounded, and that's where they hmm. surrendered. Wow, wow. So um, Cornwallis's forces are down in Trenton, and then they hear this fighting going on well to their rear. How do they respond to this? 
You know, it's fascinating. And uh, one of the aspects of military history is to understand KOKOA, which is the acronym which ex sort of explains what the weather is like, what the terrain is like. Um, there was a garrison of the 16th Light Dragoons who were a mere six miles away, but because of the weather patterns that day and because of the landscape, they didn't hear mm. what was going on on the, at the battlefield. Mm. But 12 miles away, Cornwallis was waking up expecting to fight a battle in Trenton on seven mm. at 7.30 in the morning. He did hear the cannonade. Wow. And he did hear the musket fire and immediately got his troops on the quick march uh, north to um, try to catch up to to Washington. So there he was expecting to fight a battle on the Assunpink Creek that morning. And yet he had to march his troops north mm -hmm. uh, to try and catch up with Washington, which, of course, he never did. They mm -hmm. went all in different different directions. Right. Um, and and after this battle, um, it, it the Cornwallis brought his troops back up to what is today New Brunswick um, and New York and Staten Island. And the British never occupied the Jerseys again. Uh, mm -hmm. There were more battles and skirmishes that were fought in the Jerseys throughout the revolution than any other state. Washington spent more time in New Jersey than any other state. But it was after these 10 crucial days, the British never, never were able to occupy this territory aside from the the uh, very close to their supply line in in new york harbor well wow. we've talked a little bit of <clears throat> excuse me about the new england influence here and here uh we're talking with roger williams the proprietor of one of the guys from 10 crucial days and i hope you'll be able to see him if you go to the uh parks in new jersey and see washington's crossing but we've been talking a bit about the New Englanders. It occurred to me, Roger, you're a New Englander who moved to New Jersey. I'm a New Jerseyan who moved to New England. So, <laughs> out, out. Um, so this is really where much of the fighting takes place. What about um, there are various New England officers involved? Someone has asked about Baron von Steuben, who's not a New Englander. Was he around then, or is he? Does no, he... this was before von Steuben. Yeah. Von Steuben yeah. Yeah. Uh, actually joined the forces uh, during the Philadelphia campaign, right. which is 17, 17, 1777, late in seventeen seventy seven. So it was uh, essentially uh, eight months, eight or nine months later. Now, someone asked about John Brooks, who's a Massachusetts officer. I don't know how your detailed knowledge of the rosters of the New Englanders we want to represent here. Um, you know, you've mentioned John Glover, I think we could talk about all day. And yeah, sure. Um, well, there were a number, I don't know uh, Brooks in particular, but uh, there were a number of yep. the Massachusetts yeah, yeah. regiments um, that were engaged, certainly uh, at the Battle of Trenton and the Battle of Assunpink Creek. Um, as I said, many of the uh, new uh, the hand and uh, Hitchcock's brigade was at the vanguard mm -hmm. uh, that had many of the Massachusetts regiments um, that were engaged in the Battle of Princeton as well. But there were a lot of Massachusetts boys who who were who fought in these battles for sure. On TenCrucialDays.org, you'll see there's an About tab. And on the about tab, you'll see a downloads. And I have the order of battle mm. um, that come from Larry Kidder's book, uh, 10 Crucial Days, available for, for download for free. So you can get those. Great. Great. Uh, and Jonathan wants me to remind you of Laomi Baldwin. I, is the... not, one, not one that I remember okay. off the top of my head. <laughs> okay. Well, Jonathan on to talk about him next time. Um, you're also doing a musical. This came to us. Uh, we had a composer and a lyricist uh, want us to give them the tour. And uh, push comes to shove, we ended up becoming executive producer. I'm an executive producer for this musical in development, just wow. called The Crossing. You go to thecrossingmusical.com. You can hear some of our music. We're actually looking for uh, high schools now to partner with, license-free 
to help us. Uh, the purpose of the musical is really to get this into the high schools to learn about what happened here. And Thomas Paine is really a focus character, along with Jacob Francis, who was a indentured, uh, a free black man, an indentured service who ended his indenture in Salem, Massachusetts, and joined the 16th Continentals. Um, and he's one of the main characters in our musical, The Crossing. Wow, that, that sounds great. So um, you're an unbiased observer. How do you think it is? Do you like it? You know, when we were first told by the composer that we should come in and listen to the music, we were terrified. Mm -hmm. uh, we had no idea what, you know, what are we going to tell these guys if we didn't like it? Yeah. We were bowled over. I, it, the music is just so inspiring. The musical is funny. Mm -hmm. um, it's got some great scenes. Uh, but the, the scene between Jacob Francis, this indentured um, man who joined the Continentals, uh, on one side of the stage, um, and Billy Lee, Washington's uh, enslaved um, servant, on the other side mm. of the stage, singing about uh, freedom, will mm. just absolutely bring you to tears. Wow. And so this is free if a high school wants to perform it. You'll license it to them? We're, we're As we are in development, we're looking yeah. for high schools who are interested in co partnering with us uh, to, um, uh, to, to help us get this on, uh, get this onto the stage. Larry Kidder, the author is going to be writing curriculum to go along with it. So if you're interested, just email me, roger at 10 and, and, uh, Wonderful. we'd be happy to start talk to you. Wonderful. And we'll hope that it does get performed because this is a great story and it has great resonance well beyond 2026. I mean, it's a story we keep telling and we'll keep telling. And Thomas Paine certainly saw the in the depths of the winter, this story that emerges from the banks. If you, if you, if you go to the crossingmusical.com and you, you see the tab that says music, you can listen uh, to some of the songs that are in the musical. Uh, one song that will just have you, you know, hoisting your mead, hoisting your beer, uh, is Alfeder Sane. And this is the scene after the Battle of Trenton when the Continentals are back in Pennsylvania and they've just beaten the Hessians. It is the song is that's a real showstopper. Really? Sounds great. Now I'm looking forward to hearing it and seeing it. So thank you for telling us about it. We've been talking with Roger Williams from 10 Crucial Days about Washington's Crossing and all that goes into that great story, which you're fortunate enough to keep telling, telling to people who visit and telling to our listeners. And let me, are there any other things we should talk about while we're here, Roger? It's been a long well, I, I encourage everybody, anyone who's interested in the American Revolution, as far as I'm concerned, uh, the 10 Crucial Days historic area should be on your bucket list. Mm -hmm. There's so much here. Uh, the home of Richard Stockton at Morven. Mm -hmm. uh, Princeton Battlefield, Washington Crossing, the Swan Collection at Washington Crossing Park, New Jersey, the Trent House, uh, Colonial Home. You know, we, we know you boys up there in um, Massachusetts started this mess, but it was it really was fought down here. Right, right. Yeah, it's a great story. And do you do the reenactment of Washington's Crossing on the 25th? Uh, I, I am a member of the Sons of the American Revolution Color Guard. Okay. Um, so I, I haven't done it yet, um, but I do dress up in the uniform of the 3rd New Jersey Regiment, which ironically spent most of its time up at Fort Ticonderoga. Um, <laughs> but um, I, I, don't do the, I'm, I don't do the actual crossing. I leave that to the young kids. <laughs> good, good. Very good. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And I want to thank uh, Jonathan Lane, our producer, and want to encourage everyone to go visit Washington's Crossing and check out the 10 Crucial Days. And also, you know, when we started this, Roger, we imagined we'd have our listeners would be friends in and around New England. And maybe we gave the impression today that we are more Massachusetts centric than we really are because we have listeners all over the world. And I want to thank them. And this week we're going to do something a little bit different. Um, I've Na usually I end by naming some places where we have listeners. And so this week, there's actually a pattern to the towns where people are listening. And if you can discern the pattern, what I want you to do is email Jonathan Lane, that's jlane at 
masshist.org, M-A-S-S-H-I-S-T, one word for Massachusetts Historical Society, masshist.org. Tell him what the pattern is, and he will send you one of our Revolution 250 lapel pins if you're one of the first five folks to respond. So this week, I want to acknowledge our listeners in Sumter, South Carolina, Montgomery, New York, DeKalb, Illinois, Schuylerville, New York, and Wayne, Pennsylvania. And what do these towns have in common? Tell Jonathan Lane. No, I don't. I, I didn't <laughs> <want> to Roger. <laughs> Maybe this was too easy. And I want to thank all of you for listening, everyone else in various parts of the world for tuning in, Roger Williams and Jonathan Lane. And now we will be piped out on the road to Boston. Thank you.